we wanted to have this gathering today for the for the public to ask us questions about the vaccine. Um, we, we do wanna see uh, a, an increased uptake in vaccines. We know vaccines work. We know vaccines are the way out of this, but we also know people have a lot of questions. So we, we definitely wanna answer your questions today. So we've assembled a panel of experts. We have with us Dr. Jean Marie Mayer. She's the hospital epidemiologist for University of Utah Health for our hospitals and clinics. We have Dr. Andrew Pavia, the Chief of the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at University of Utah Health. And we have Dr. Tori Metz, an Associate Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She's also a Maternal Fetal Medicine Specialist and Vice Chair of Research for Obstetrics and Gynecology at University of Utah Health. And we will have uh, someone putting everyone's spellings and titles uh, in the chat for any media who are joining us today. So I'm just gonna get started with you, Dr. Mayer. Can you uh, give us a snapshot of, first, let's talk about what we're seeing in our community and then tell us what we're seeing in our hospitals. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, so I think everybody's aware that across the nation, we're seeing just rising rates of uh, COVID um, and that's what we're also seeing in Utah. Um, in Utah, we had cases that really had sort of plateaued and were at a lower level um, during the spring. And over the last um, several weeks, we're just seeing increasing numbers. Our cases are really doubling. Um, uh, the, the cases that, um, that are occurring across the, the state, um, uh, it, when, when we look at our, our hospital numbers, um, we were at low levels of patients hospitalized with COVID at University Hospital. We were down to, gosh, maybe only five or six patients in the hospital. And over the last couple of weeks, we're starting to max out and we're in the neighborhood of more like 30 to 40 patients every day in our hospital. Um, so uh, I, I think this is something that, um, uh, and, and as we are across the nation, um, our rates within the state of Utah are now at high rates of transmission of COVID, um, where our percentage positivity, uh, when we look at person over person, it's like 15% of, of all individuals being tested or, or positive with COVID. Okay, um, I, would also, I would also say that the other thing that's important to note as well is what we are tending to see now is younger people getting infected with COVID. So previously, when this all started, say last year, um, we were having more issues with individuals hospitalized who were older. Um, now we're seeing more and more younger individuals. So more even you know, 25 to 35 year olds being hospitalized and then um, you know, more middle-aged group rather than those that were elderly. And I know that you know, Dr. Pavia can speak to what they're seeing at Primary Children's Hospital as well, starting to see more children being hospitalized. And Dr. Mayor, can you just clarify that point? Younger, we're seeing more younger people. Is that because of the Delta variant or because they're largely, or they're more likely to be unvaccinated? Why are we seeing younger people? Yeah, that's a great question, Kathy. So, um, I think probably a, a combination of both, um, you know, in terms of you're, you're much less likely to become infected if you have been vaccinated. And we know that the older age groups in our, in our state are vaccinated. So those individuals who are unvaccinated have a much higher chance of being infected with, with COVID. Um, we were on a, a call with the health department earlier today and you're at least four times less likely to be infected if, if you've been vaccinated. And uh, we know that in our uh, age groups, our younger age groups in Utah, that there's just a, a less of an uptake of vaccination. And I think the other thing that we just know that that Delta variant is so much more contagious and infectious. And I think along with that, um, over the summer, we've, we've had, um, there, there's people are just doing more, you know, at, people are out together at events, um, uh, there's less masking. So there's a, a, a more contagious virus 
and people are out there and doing more things and mixing with one another. So I think it's a combination of everything. Okay. Kathy, if I can add to that, um, you know, when we last talked, we didn't really know whether Delta was causing more severe disease or more hospitalizations. But uh, there have been three studies, one from Scotland, one from the UK, one from Ontario, that have come out in the last few days that suggests that uh, Delta is in fact causing more hospitalizations and more severe disease. And I think that's reflected in what we're seeing in young people and children as well. Okay, thanks, Dr. Pavia. Um, and I'm gonna get to you in a minute. We're gonna talk about school issues and Dr. Metz, we're gonna talk about pregnancy, but I have a couple questions first for you, Dr. Mayor, that are coming in. So we have a really interesting one here. Um, we have uh, someone who's saying their family tested positive for COVID in December and they're recovered. Um, they're worried about getting the vaccine. They're reading about um, inflammatory reactions and they're wondering, um, what are reactions from people who've had COVID to the vaccine? And is there natural immunity? So those who have had COVID, do they still need to get the vaccine? And um, so, so can, you, can you touch on those questions? Yeah, that's, that's a great few questions in there. So um, I would say that what we know is that the vaccine provides broader protection than natural infection. So it's broader infection, uh, broader immunity, and it's felt to have more prolonged duration than natural, than natural infection. Um, and uh, it's still recommended that people that were previously infected go ahead and do receive the vaccine. And there are some individuals that for example, with long hauler syndrome, it's felt that many of those individuals actually improve after they've been vaccinated. So um, I, I, my recommendation would be if you previously had natural infection that you go ahead and get vaccinated. And to, to clarify, Dr. Mayer, natural immunity only lasts, we're saying usually roughly 90 days. And then I've also heard, and, and maybe you can clarify this for us, that people who've had COVID and get vaccinated actually get a better immune response. Correct. Is that correct? correct? Correct. So it's it's unclear with reinfections, you know, how long, what, what's the duration of protection you have from natural immunity if you've previously actually been infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. What we do know is that vaccination provides longer protection and broader protection. So as individuals are exposed to newer variants, there's better protection from the vaccine than there is with natural infection. Okay, and then we have, um, we do have a question about mandates. Um, should, should Utah look to mandates? So I, I do wanna be clear here today, our role here uh, as physicians and researchers, we, um, we supply our elected officials with valid scientific and medical information for them to make the decision. So we're not necessarily gonna be weighing in on what we think policy should be here today, but we're gonna talk about what we think are, um, you know, sound medical practices. So um, when we're talking about vaccines, um, what do you all think about incentives and mandates? Do you think those things help? I'm going to give that to you, uh, Dr. Pavia. Yeah, so, you know, we did uh, a series of surveys and some focus groups as part of the HERO project. And that uh, incentives were not really something that people said would motivate them a great deal. But what came up a lot was that getting vaccinated for many people is difficult and expensive. They were worried that they would have to take time off from work to go get vaccinated. And they were worried that they might miss a day if they had some aches and pains or ran a fever the day after vaccination. So, you know, I, I don't have the answer for that, but I think um, what can help a lot of people is to come up with ways to make it affordable and uh, more practical for them to get vaccinated. And that may mean time, time paid off, or that may mean a little bit of a uh, compensation for the time they might lose. Okay, and uh, thanks, Dr. Pavia. I have a question for you, Dr. Metz. So we have someone who's saying, can we get a better answer than just, yes, you should get it while you're pregnant? Why? And is, is it safer? Um, 
why is it safer uh, for pregnant women? And, and so this, this person is saying, we're hearing do it, but why? Tell us why. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And um, I'm not surprised that there's a question about this. I think early on, um, we were a little bit conservative about this. We weren't really sure because pregnant patients had not been in the initial trials, but you know, some things have changed since then. And we have a lot more information now about vaccination and pregnancy. Um, so much so that, you know, the American College of OBGYNs and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine who take care of all, you know, the physicians involved in those studies take care of all the pregnant women in the United States are really recommending that pregnant women be vaccinated now. Um, and that's not just a shift in the way we think about it, it's a shift in the data that we have. So we have a lot more information now that the CDC has collected um, as women have decided to give them information as they've been vaccinated during pregnancy about their pregnancy outcomes, about side effects. And what we're seeing is that, you know, vaccination really is safe in pregnancy and it is as effective in pregnancy as it is in non-pregnant um, individuals, which was another question that had come up. Um, I think, you know, why to do it in pregnancy specifically, um, it's really the issue of uh, pregnant women are, are, are vulnerable um, when they're pregnant in that when they get infections, they tend to get sicker than people who are not pregnant. And that happens with flu. Um, we are definitely also seeing that happen with COVID, um, that pregnant women who get COVID, COVID are sicker than those who get it outside of pregnancy. And so that's why there's such a push to say, you know, pregnant women are at higher risk and we know that this vaccine is safe and effective in pregnancy. And so we really want pregnant women to be getting vaccinated. Um, you know, there's also benefits to the baby. And that's something that I think a lot of patients consider as well is that, um, you know, when we get vaccinated, when we're pregnant, we have an antibody response to that vaccination. So we make antibodies and that's what protects us against that virus. Those antibodies also cross the placenta and go to benefit the baby so that when the baby's born, before the baby would be able to get any kind of vaccinations, the mom's antibodies that were made can protect that baby in that really vulnerable neonatal period. So it's an opportunity for pregnant moms not to just protect themselves, but also to protect their baby. Okay, and Dr. Metz, I have a couple um, follow-ups for you. So um, let's try and do a little rapid fire round with sure. you today. So is the vaccine safe for all stages of pregnancy, all terms? Yes, we can give it anytime during pregnancy is safe. Okay, and um, this question here, I believe is related to pregnancy of, of the percentage of women, and this says 90%, I, I, I don't know if that's uh, a correct figure, but um, of those who have not been vaccinated, what is the percentage of those who have already had the virus? Is that something that you know the answer to? Um, I don't, we don't know the answer to how many have already had the virus and that's why they don't get vaccinated in pregnancy, but we do know that the vaccination rates in pregnancy are very low, um, which is very concerning to obstetricians and why I wanted to come here today and answer questions that people have or any concerns that you have. So hopefully I can address it and help you feel safe doing it. And do we have evidence that the vaccine won't affect an unborn child and won't affect fertility? Yeah, I mean, I think there, there are definitely data out there now um, that say that the vaccination does not result in pregnancy complications. I think that there's also, it's also important to think about how these vaccines work and they're really working right there in that muscle um, where that vaccine is given. It is not something where the components of the vaccine are crossing the placenta or going to the baby in any way. The only thing that's going to the baby is that protection that your body is generating to help protect the baby. Um, but there's no reason to think that there would be any harm to baby. And I think initially that was the message. We kind of said, there's no reason to think that would be true. Now we actually have the data to back that up and say that we really are not seeing any increased risk of complications when people are getting vaccinated in pregnancy. Okay, one more question for you, Dr. Metz. We have someone here who says um, they're 40 years old, they're 32 weeks pregnant with an IVF baby, and they're nervous about getting the vaccine since their pregnancy is so high risk. What do you say to this person? 
Yeah, I, I would say I understand the hesitation that we all want to do everything we can that's best for the pregnancy, especially with high risk pregnancies. I take care of women every day with high risk pregnancies. And so I do understand that. Um, what I would say is that your risk if you were to acquire COVID in pregnancy is much higher than any kind of risk that could possibly be from the vaccination. And so the vaccine really is going to protect you and getting it in pregnancy also allows you to then pass those antibodies and protect your baby. Okay, and I'm going to turn to school issues in just a moment, um, Dr. Pafia, but before we get to that, Dr. Mayor, I'm going to ask you a couple really quick questions. Does the COVID vaccination help um, fight against the Delta variant? Yes, the COVID, the COVID vaccine has been shown to really help decrease infection with all the variants. And uh, we know that it also works with the Delta variant. Um, I think some of the concern that people have or may be hearing is that um, perhaps it doesn't work as well as it did with the earlier strains, but we do know that it still is just very effective. And the goals of the vaccine are really to reduce severe illness, hospitalization, and death. And that vaccine is still highly effective against the Delta variant. Great, thanks, Dr. Mayer. Another quick question for you. For those who had Johnson & Johnson, um, what is the efficacy rate against the Delta variant? And is there a booster on the horizon with Johnson & Johnson? Um, so uh, again, um, all the vaccines that we have currently under emergency use authorization in the United States are effective against the Delta variant. Um, we do know that the data that was initially presented with the Pfizer Moderna versus the Johnson & Johnson in terms of preventing symptomatic disease, it, the, the mRNA vaccines were had a higher uh, clinical efficacy in those clinical trials. But again, in terms of preventing serious disease hospitalizations, all of them are, are highly effective. Okay, and I'm gonna to turn to you now, Dr. Pavia. Before we get to school issues though, since you have a background with the CDC, I wanna ask you this question. Why is it taking so long to get full FDA approval of the vaccines? Why are we still under um, this emergency use authorization? It's a great question, one that lots of people have. Um, full authorization has a couple of components. So one is to have enough follow-up and safety data. And that was achieved a long time ago. So the FDA has more information that would go towards the safety and efficacy for full licensure for this vac these vaccines than they have for almost any other vaccine when it's licensed. But the rest of the full authorization is a lot of um, fairly technical and bureaucratic requirements. The companies have to show that their manufacturing plants are clean and effective, that they have a, a, a long-term supply chain, all sorts of regulatory requirements. Those are in law. FDA can't speed those up. So people put a lot of attention, sort of understandably, on the fact that it's still under EUA, but it's not for safety or efficacy reasons. It's for very technical regulatory reasons. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about school students starting in a few weeks. Um, we're gonna talk about masking in a second, but just right uh, out of the gate here, um, is it, is it do, do parents still have enough time to get their kids vaccinated? You, you can't at this point be fully vaccinated before school starts, at least in most districts, because that's like a five week process. But can you talk us through that and what, what level of protection will students have if say they go out and get vaccinated today? Yeah, sure. So you, you start to develop some antibodies about a week after your first dose of vaccine. Um, and those peak at about two weeks. And then after the second dose, which is three weeks out, uh, in another two weeks, you hit sort of maximum levels of protection. So it takes five weeks to be fully protected. Against the older strains, one dose did okay. Um, depending on who you read, 50 to 70% protection. One of the dangerous things about Delta is that uh, a single dose of vaccine doesn't provide much protection. It's only down to about 30%. So, uh, you know, getting started as soon as you can will mean you're fully protected as soon as you can. And until you've hit that second vaccine dose, I think it's 
important to do other things you can do to protect your child. Have them wear a mask indoors. Uh, you know, avoid other very risky situations. Um, maintain social distance. Okay, so let's talk about masking. Um, there are some questions here about should students wear masks going back to school? In addition to your work as a physician and with the CDC, you've also been in a project, you, you mentioned it earlier, the Utah Hero Study. Um, do, you, do you wanna talk a little bit about masking and in, in some of the research that's come out of that? Tell, tell people a little bit about Utah Hero and what that work entailed. Sure. Yeah, so, you know, we, um, so Heroes was a project that had many different aspects to it, but one important one, led in part by my colleague Adam Hirsch was looking at ways to uh, understand what was going on in schools with transmission and how to keep uh, schools open safely. Lots of partners involved in that, educators, school administrators, the CDC. Uh, but the bottom line of what we learned uh, was that you can keep schools open safely. And we did that successfully in Utah when you have universal masking in the schools when you do your best to maintain decent distances uh, between students and then use other measures, ventilation where you can do it, keep uh, groups of students together. So in elementary schools out of about 50 classrooms that had a student come in with COVID, only three had as much as a single another child get infected when masks were worn. So we know that masks in the classroom work. The other things we've learned is the kids tolerate masks. They don't like them. I don't like wearing masks. You don't like wearing masks. But kids do really well, and they don't have a political agenda that masks are taking away their freedom. They understand that it's the way things are done in school, uh, and you know that it really works pretty well. So we know that we can have schools operate in person safely with masking. We also know that from other countries around the world where masking wasn't done, schools can have explosive outbreaks. And, and we saw that in other studies done in the United States where masking was inconsistent or not enforced. So we know masks work, it's our best tool for the kids who can't be vaccinated, but for the kids who can be vaccinated, vaccine is really the best tool. Um, and one of the, you know, there are not, there's not that much good news right now um, with the spread of Delta, but one of the good news, uh, items about Utah is that we're doing a pretty good job of vaccinating our adolescents. About 42.6% uh, of adolescents, that is kids 12 to 18, have had one dose of vaccine at least, uh, which actually puts us, it's one of the few things in which we're doing better than the rest of the country. Um, and so I think that's a great start. We've got a ways to go. We'd really like to see, you know, pretty much every uh, uh, adolescent vaccinated, but we're on our way for that. And, and, and Kathy, if I'm gonna address one other thing that I hear a lot of, and maybe you were gonna ask this, uh, you know, one of the reasons that parents are sometimes hesitant to vaccinate their kids is they hear, well, I've heard that kids don't get sick with COVID, it's no big deal. And if you talk to any pediatrician who has been through the last 18 months, they will smack their forehead in pain when they hear that. Because, you know, while it's true that it's much worse to be a 75 year old, than a 16 year old when you get COVID. Uh, there are many, many kids who suffer a lot of consequences. They can be hospitalized, uh, they can die, uh, but more importantly, they can also have long lasting consequences which can really impact their life. And we're seeing increased disease burden here in Utah. Uh, we had gone uh, for a number of weeks in the spring where there were almost no children with COVID at primary children's. And in the last week, we've had three to seven kids in the hospital with several in the ICU during that time period. But what we're seeing is not what really scares me. What scares me is what we just heard from colleagues at Arkansas Children's Hospital. It's a children's hospital very much like primary children's, about the same size. Right now they have 27 children hospitalized with COVID, not, not because it was found incidentally, but sick with COVID, and seven in the intensive care unit. And last week, two Arkansas children died. Now, I don't mean to be an alarmist because you know, kids will do okay for the most part. And if your child was diagnosed today, don't panic. But we have a really effective, really safe vaccine. And, you know, as a parent and as a doctor, I've got to say it is the right thing to do for your children. And if we can answer questions that people have that make them reluctant to help them do that, that's really what we're here for. And before I leave you, uh, 
with the school topic, at least for the moment, I, I wanna ask you, Dr. Pavia, to, to really um, explain the risk benefit ratio between having COVID versus some of the things people may have heard about related to the vaccine. I know we've heard about a couple, um, there were a couple isolated incidents with a with the particular heart condition. So do you wanna to touch on that briefly and talk about the risk benefit ratio? Yeah. So of course, risk benefit ratio means, you know, what's the risk of uh, not getting vaccinated versus what are the risks from the vaccine? And we have learned that there are a very modest number of cases of inflammation of the tissues around the heart, uh, which is called pericarditis or the heart muscle called myocarditis. We've seen a few of these at primary children's that are associated with vaccine. We see a lot of cases of it associated with viral infections all the time. Uh, the best estimate is that for young adult males, that's something like eight per million doses of vaccine, which is really, really rare. It's about the chance of getting um, hit by lightning if you work outdoors in Utah. So, uh, and you compare that to the number of hospitalizations for kids in the same age group or young adults in the same age group. And you're gonna prevent, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's something like 20 hospitalizations for every case of myocarditis. And so far, nobody's died of myocarditis. We don't know of anyone who's had permanent heart damage from vaccine associated myocarditis, but our, our pediatric cardiology friends at Primary Children's have seen a number of kids with permanent heart damage from the, getting COVID infection or MISC afterwards. So it's a little like, I like to use the example of airbags. Uh, you know, every year one or two people get killed by an airbag going off when it shouldn't have, but they save tens of thousands of lives each year. And so because of that, you know, do you wanna drive a car with no seat belts and an airbag? Um, knowing that there is a slight risk to having that airbag on board, but a much, much bigger benefit. Okay, thanks, Dr. Pavia. Um, Dr. Mayer, this is a, re I'm really glad someone asked this question. I think it's a really good one. If you've already had COVID and it really wasn't a big deal, why bother? You know, Kathy, could you repeat the question? I, the, the, the internet cut out. Sure, sure. Um, this is, um, if you've already had COVID and it just wasn't a big deal, why should you bother? Mm -hmm. um, like we said before, um, previously having COVID, gives you some level of protection and you may have done well with that particular strain that you were exposed to. But as we go through this, we're seeing that there's other virus strains that we could be exposed to. And the next, the next time you may not be so lucky. Um, the other thing I would say is um, by taking the vaccine, you're not just protecting yourself but you're protecting others around you. You're protecting your loved ones, your family, um, other people that, you, that you're that you with. So um, I would say that if you've had COVID, a natural infection, that the recommendations are that you go ahead and get vaccinated and further protect yourself. And then do we know if there are any long-term um, side effects from the vaccine at this point, Dr. Mayer? So typically um, it, it, when, when people have um, long-term or side effects from, from a vaccine, you would typically see it within like six to eight weeks. Um, again, we've had millions and mil millions of people vaccinated. And we know that again, the, the risk of vaccine, um, it's just so rare compared to the complications from actual COVID infection. And I think um, there's a much, much higher risk of having long-term consequences of natural infection with COVID than one would from the vaccine. So when we talk about say like the long hauler syndrome, that there are studies that suggest maybe about half the people that have COVID may have some long-term consequences of um, infection with coronavirus. So much, much higher risk of having long-term consequences from natural infection with, uh, with the SARS-CoV-2 virus than you would from a vaccine. Most um, issues with the vaccine are, are very mild, short-term, short-lived right around the time that individuals are getting vaccinated. Um, and 
really protects you against uh, the natural infection uh, with 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 uh, SARS-CoV-2. And I would I would ask people to really think about um, you're making a choice. You're making a choice between getting a vaccine, one of the vaccines, or you're making a choice of getting infected with with SARS-CoV-2 and COVID. And when you're doing your own personal risk benefit, you know, think of think of that, think of those choices. Kathy, could I add something to that? Sure. One of the most common things people say is, um, you know, the vaccine hasn't been around long enough. It, we don't know enough about it. And, you know, and, and that's a legitimate thing for people to feel. Uh, and that was certainly true in December and January when it first came out. But as of today, 344 million doses have been given in the United States alone. Uh, we are following people now who've been vaccinated for about 14 months. And as Dr. Mayer said, most of the side effects are going to show up in the first few weeks. Uh, and there are intense efforts to collect all the safety information on the vaccine. So it's no longer new. It's not something that we don't have a lot of data on or don't have a lot of experience on. Um, and while it's understandable to feel that way, at this point, we really know a great deal about it. We may learn more, but we've got uh, a lot of experience and a lot of safety data. Thanks, Dr. Bian. Important to point out, mRNA, the technology that gave us this vaccine, that is not new. So I, I think that's, that's important. The science behind the vaccine, though the COVID vaccine is new, the science behind it is, is not. And um, one other, uh, two quick points for you, Dr. Mayer, and then I'm gonna go back to you, Dr. Metz. Um, one, you talked about long haul, long hauler symptoms. That many people who even had mild illness have mm -hmm. more serious long hauler side effects. Is that true? That, that is true. Um, folks that really had very mild symptoms, maybe later on can develop really longer term complications that can really be life altering, um, you know, chronic fatigue, brain fog, um, even things like loss of taste and smell, loss of hair. These are all things that may not be life threatening, but you know, can really be impactful in someone's life. I'm, I'm, I've been reading a lot about uh, hair loss after COVID. That's, that's an interesting one. And very quickly, um, before I turn over to Dr. Metz, Dr. Mayer, how do we know when someone has Delta variant? Um, to know that specifically that if someone actually has a Delta variant, um, we have a great public health lab in, in our state. And what they are doing is every positive um, test uh, that, that we're getting from our various healthcare systems are being sent to our public health lab. And they do um, genetic sequencing to, to determine what type of virus strain. So um, over the last several weeks, we're finding that about 85% of all the isolates that they're sequencing are the Delta variant. So um, I don't know if each individual would know that did I have the Delta variant or not, but the chances are, the odds are, if you get sick today in Utah, it's very likely it's from the Delta variant. Okay, thanks, Dr. Mayer. Um, Dr. Metz, a, a question for you. Um, this person is saying they're seriously considering getting vaccinated, but they have, they're seeing limited evidence regarding lactating mothers and their baby. And um, they're, uh, it's, they, they understand that it's been shown that COVID-19 antibodies have been shown to be present in breast milk. Um, which this person would love, love to pass on to their child, but they're concerned that there's so little information um, about um, vaccinated mothers and, and what they pass on to their babies. Do you have any insight into this? Yeah, I can speak to that um, in general. I'm glad to hear you're thinking about being vaccinated. And I do think that during lactation or while you're breastfeeding is also a great time to be vaccinated. Um, for exactly the reason that you're describing, uh, those antibodies that you make in response to the vaccine do cross uh, via the breast milk to your baby. So you're able to protect your baby that way by, by antibodies going that way. That's not something that's unique to 
this particular vaccine. And um, that's something I perhaps should have emphasized before, maybe a little bit more. I mean, we vaccinate mothers all the time in pregnancy. We vaccinate mothers all the time while they're breastfeeding. And one of the main reasons we do that is because we want this antibody cross passage to occur both across the placenta and through the breast milk to the baby. And so we do know that uh, among those who are vaccinated, those antibodies are made and they do pass through the breast milk to the baby and offer protection to the baby. Dr. Mason, you also want to explain why the vaccine itself can't get across the breast milk to the baby? Yeah, I, it's and I think same thing with the placenta. You know, we are not the vaccine and the vaccine components absolutely do not cross to the baby directly. They, you know, you're not vaccinating your baby, you're vaccinating yourself, your body sees that vaccine and then basically generates a response to that vaccine in the form of antibodies. Those antibodies are then circulating in your bloodstream and then those can pass both across the placenta via your bloodstream or they can enter the breast and the breast milk and then be passed to uh, the baby. And you're welcome to jump in too, Dr. Pavia, because I know you're a pediatrician, but from the, from the mom's side, um, that's how I would typically explain it to mothers. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if you think about it, it's, it's 31,000th of a gram of vaccine. It never leaves yeah. either the muscle in your shoulder or the lymph nodes in your, uh, in your armpit or your neck. Um, and it's degraded pretty quickly. There's really no way enough of it can get into the, it doesn't get into the bloodstream to begin with. And there's no way that any significant portion of that could be put into breast milk. Right. And, I, and it's, I think you know, the... pediatricians, we worry a lot um, when uh, a young infant, a very young infant's exposed to COVID and having the mother having been vaccinated and providing antibodies through the breast milk really is very reassuring. We believe it's protective. Yeah, and I think that's an important piece is just, this isn't a new idea, right? This is what our bodies are made to do. Moms, you know, see viruses, we get exposed to things. We make antibodies for our babies who can't quite do that yet or can't get the vaccines yet in the same way that we can. And so it's really an opportunity for us, um, you know, as mothers and parents to protect those babies during that really early time period. And thanks, thanks Dr. Metz. We have a lot of questions here, so I'm, I'm going to maybe try and blend a few questions together about mixed messages. Um, we were saying masks on, masks off, now masks are on again. Um, we're telling everybody to get vaccinated, yet we're hearing more and more um, that vaccinated people can spread, they can transmit COVID, and they can also get COVID and, and in some cases get sick. Um, Dr. Mayor, I'm going to start with you on this one. Talk to us a little bit about mixed messaging when it comes to masking and vaccinations. Why? Yeah, I think that's a great question, and I can really understand why there would be confusion about that. Um, I think part of what we've seen is that the virus is changing. So it's not that really the message on masking, it, it's, it's related to you know, the virus itself. So the Delta variant is just a much more contagious, infectious strain of the virus. And people who are vaccinated still have uh, great protection um, with that vaccine, but no vaccine is 100%. And with this particular virus strain, um, the, the vaccine is not as effective in preventing um, infection much, much better than, than without being uh, vaccinated. And again, um, in those individuals who are vaccinated, much lower risk of getting an infection. But if you do get infected, you likely won't have severe infection. You won't be hospitalized, you know, much, much, much lower chance. But what the data, the, the new current data where the CDC is really making these newer recommendations is they find that when people are infected with the Delta strain and they do get infected, that they're shedding a lot of virus. So, um, in, so they can transmit and, and make other people ill. So again, getting vaccinated overall still protects others around you because that individual who's vaccinated is still much less likely 
to become infected. Um, but if that person does become infected, they can spread that to others. And that's really where the messaging about masking that until we really have a really high percentage of individuals vaccinated, um, this is why we're doing everything that we can. We're using all the tools in our toolbox with getting vaccinated, masking, and then, you know, you know doing some of the physical distancing as well. So as long that, as the, yeah, as long as the virus is changing, the messaging is going to keep changing. I think that's probably the bottom line, correct? Right, right. And 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 again, I would say that this is something that we look at all the time. I mean, things change over time. And as the information comes in, um, it, 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 to, 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 to change the recommends, recommendations based on that changing science. And, um, and, and from, from what I've heard is that the concern was really a lot of recent data that came out of some transmission clusters and outbreaks that occurred really earlier this month. So really very timely and getting that information out very quickly. Okay, and I think a couple good questions here. You touched on this earlier, Dr. Pavia, but why should we trust a vaccine that the FDA has not yet fully approved? Well, I think I touched on that. I mean, it, it, there has been extensive experience with 344 million doses. There's up to 14 months of experience with it now. The FDA is just needing to fulfill its legal requirements to check all the boxes on their standards for licensure. But from a safety and efficacy point of view, they could have done that months ago. Uh, and we, we don't know exactly when they'll give the full licensure. Their hands are kind of tied by the law and by the manufacturers giving them some of those details about you know, what country you're gonna buy a given raw ingredient from. Uh, so really, we should stop talking about full licensure as if it's a magic point at which we know the vaccine is safe. It's just not true. Okay. And let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about those who feel like, you know, natural immunity is better. They're, they're perhaps um, um, focused on natural medicines, natural remedies. They feel like maybe the vaccine is putting something a chemical or something foreign. Um, can you can you talk to us a little bit about and, and kind of keep this as quick as you can? We want to get as many yeah. questions. I know that's a lot for a short answer, but what tell us a little bit about mRNA and is it a chemical? It, are these vaccines chemicals and putting something yeah. foreign in your body? This is actually a pretty simple vaccine. It has got very few ingredients. The mRNA is a set of instructions, computer code that you're body would make if you saw the virus anyway. And it's and then the body uses it to make proteins, which then let it make antibodies. So this isn't, you know, a whole slew of weird toxic chemicals. It's actually just the message uh, about how to make protective antibodies to protect you from the virus. And, you know, and we'd like to think that natural immunity is better. It is for some viruses. For this virus, as much as it changes, uh, we've actually been able to make uh, vaccines which give you better protection than your own body is able to make. And that's true for the other coronaviruses before SARS-CoV-2. Uh, they just don't make a great an, uh, immune response. When you say computer code, I, I just want you to be really clear. We are not talking about microchips. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, there's no no chip, but it's, uh, it's the template. It's the uh, message set that tells uh, your cell, how to make a protein. Okay. And Dr. Mayer, of those we're seeing hospitalized right now, um, do you know roughly how many of those have been vaccinated versus unvaccinated? Uh, yes. Um, so I've looked at, um, for example, at, at University Hospital and we're a tertiary care academic center. So we have people getting transferred to us that have more um, other medical conditions and underlying. So we've had about 300 individuals who have been hospitalized and about 10% of those have been vaccinated. Um, and I would say that of those um, that, uh, so, so again, the overwhelming 90% of the individuals who are being hospitalized now at University Hospital most recently, the overwhelming majority are unvaccinated. 
And of those individuals who are vaccinated and are hospitalized, 40% of those individuals had severe immunocompromised conditions. So for example, um, had a transplant. So we know that people that have significant severe immunocompromised states don't respond as well to the vaccine. Um, the feeling is, is those individuals would likely have benefit from the vaccine, but we don't expect it to be as high as someone with a normal immune system. Okay, we have a lot of really good questions and um, we're starting to run out of time. So I'm just gonna ask you guys to, to keep your questions as, as quick as possible. And I know that some of these are complicated and I'm gonna give you one, Dr. Pavia. Um, you know, this vaccine seemed really rushed when we've been uh, dealing with HIV AIDS for over 30 years. Why are we feeling so safe about this vaccine when we have other viruses? you know, that we don't have this kind of technology for? And also, is there any other example of an mRNA vaccine? So mRNA vaccines have been under research for over 10 years. There are other mRNA vaccines that are in clinical trials right now for flu and for cancer. So it's really exciting technology. Being able to get a vaccine that works this well is a combination of having a virus for which the body can make a good defense and the technology to make a good vaccine. So for HIV, it's just incredibly difficult because HIV's job is to evade the immune system and to destroy the immune system. And that's part of why we've not been able to make a successful vaccine. Dr. Metz, are there any known complications for, um, from the vaccine for pregnant women? No, we, I mean, I can honestly say that we do not know of any complications um, that will be associated with the vaccine. Um, they have looked at complication rates among pregnant patients who have received the vaccine, and they are the same rates as the general population. Um, so we really are not seeing increased risk at all um, when, get, when people are deciding to get it during pregnancy. Okay, Dr. Mayer, um, someone is saying they took the J&J &J shot and they wanna know if boosters do eventually become available, can they mix and match that with another, like say Pfizer comes out with the booster eventually, can a J&J &J person get a Pfizer booster? Do we know? So we don't know the answer to that. That's being studied right now. And um, currently we're not allowed to um, go outside the, um, the, uh, the EUA, but the, the, the feeling is, is that in the future that we most likely will be able to. Okay. And uh, this, um, Dr. Pavia, I'm gonna give this to you. Um, it's asking about um, when there's emergency authorization given for children two plus years. Um, what do you think the risks might be? What do you think the timeline is for that? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so we, we know that the plans are to authorize, well, to submit the data, and if it looks good and if it's safe, to authorize it for six to 11-year-olds first, and then to spend more time carefully studying the two to five-year-olds. Uh, two to five-year-olds are the least likely to get very sick compared to less than one or over six. So we really are going to spend some extra time figuring out the safety and getting the dose right for that group. Best guess is for that age group is it won't be until uh, you know sometime around the new year or early next year. Okay, Dr. Metz, do we know anything about um, the vaccine and is it connected in any way to fertility concerns such as PCOS or miscarriage? Um, I'm glad that somebody asked this because I know that there's been a lot of information about this on social media. Um, I can tell you that there is not any sort of relationship between being vaccinated and having infertility or any concerns at all about fertility at following vaccination. Um, also, you know, if you were to get vaccinated and then you were to get pregnant, please go ahead and proceed with that second dose of vaccination. There's no reason to not do that. Um, we do not see a relationship either between uh, vaccination and miscarriage. Uh, it seems to be at baseline rates, um, no difference between people who are receiving vaccine in the first semester versus other people. Um, so I think we can be really reassuring about that. There 
are rumors about that that I under, that I know are out there, but there's just really no way that this vaccine could affect fertility. And there's been really good reporting that a lot of these rumors are being maliciously spread by, uh, I think, eight organizations are responsible for most of them. So it's not something that's spreading naturally. It's actually uh, intentional disinformation. But of course, you can't tell that when your friend says, I heard this. Right. Okay, a couple other, I, I want to get to all of these. So let's, um, Dr. Mayer, very quickly, um, is the spike protein um, produced by your own body when you're vaccinated, is it harmful to you? Um, so uh, you mean, so, so the, the vaccines that then sort of present to our immune cells, the spike protein that then we produce antibodies to, no. Quick enough. <laughs> um, let's see, we have a question here about, um, Okay, so let, let's talk a little bit about the Delta variant and um, boosters when they're going to become available. Um, I think you just touched on this a little bit, Dr. Mayer, about mixing and matching, but I, I'm just going to throw this out there. Is it what if somebody just said, okay, I'm going to give myself my own booster and I'm going to go over to a, a you know, a, a vaccine facility, and I'm going to say, yeah, give me the vaccine, and they get a third one. <laughs> what do you say to that? Um, so what I would say is, at this time, it's being studied, and we would like to have the best information available so that we know who are the best individuals to receive the booster, and when, and what type of booster. So at this time, I think that what we should really be focused and concentrating on is getting as many people vaccinated for the first time, fully vaccinated for the first time. So that should really be our goal. And then when there's more information, boosters will be made available. And, and, um, and oh, yeah, it's, it's most likely that um, the people who are going to need boosters first are people very old over 80 or people uh, with severe immune system problems. Uh, there's really good evidence that out to the duration that we've studied the vaccine so far, in otherwise healthy people, the protection is still holding. Won't hold forever in all likelihood, but it's still holding. And probably also to, important to point out that when a booster does become available, it'll be the latest and greatest version that's probably better equipped to deal with the Delta variant rather than the current ones. Is that correct? Well, that's an open question because there are studies that compare new and improved vaccines that are fine-tuned for Delta with just getting a third dose. And it would be cheaper and easier if a third dose of the same vaccine worked as well. So we'll see. We, we just have to do the, we have to do the studies before we know. Okay. And then um, I, I think it's important to address this. Someone's asking about um, if you gargle with a special mouthwash, can it minimize your exposure to the virus and can it minimize transmitting it to others? I've also heard about nasal sprays. What do we say to that? I would say a mask is, 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 the, is what the tool that we should be using to prevent transmission. No evidence of any type of gargle that would protect you. Um, and if you were to gargle with a strong disinfectant for a few minutes, it would reduce the amount of viral virus in your mouth, but probably not enough to make a difference over time. Okay, and then someone here is asking, um, can we mix vaccines when the boosters become available? Immuno immunocompromised folks really want a booster and uh, we don't really even know if our first vaccine did a good job. Once again, should people try to do their own booster or just really work through their physician on this issue? What, what do you say to that? Yeah, my advice would be to wait. I, you know, that's a really hot question. It's being worked on very rapidly. ACFP spent a whole afternoon looking at the data. The studies are ongoing. I'd say have patience. Um, you're not going to get left hanging. Okay. And then I would, I would also yeah. say to that though, that what an individual can do is make sure they're masked, try to avoid, you know, uh, you know, practice physical distancing, and then ask those around you to get vaccinated. 
Okay. And here's a good question. Variants have always been around, you know, the flu, for example, and people have always survived. Why is this so different? Um, so I guess I'm the closest to an evolutionary biologist we've got here. So, <laughs> you know, um, viruses evolve and they evolve to do what they care about, which is to be spread more easily. Sometimes that results in a more deadly virus. Sometimes it results in a milder virus. We don't always understand why that is, but flu can become much more deadly as it changes. And, you know, the 1918 pandemic killed over 12 million people around the world because it was a new variant that had emerged. And just like Delta, after many variants have come through, has been the worst one so far. Yeah, the virus just managed to evolve from a tabby cat into a tiger. It was never a tabby cat, maybe, you know, a bobcat into a tiger. Okay. Dr. Metz, um, this person is asking, um, their friends got the vaccine and had trouble with their menstrual cycle. Have you heard of this? And what are your thoughts on that? Um, that is definitely something that's out there. And the NIH has put some, um, has, has interest in this and is interested in studying this because we have heard that from women. Um, it is difficult to sort out just based on anecdote. We know that menstrual cycles are affected by a variety of things. One of them is stress. Um, certainly we have all been under a lot of stress during this period over this pandemic. And so what is not known is are we really seeing differences in menstrual cycles that are related to the vaccine specifically, or is it really all these other factors that are happening? And so it's an area that is actively being studied and that we're trying to find answers to. We know that this is important to women. Um, I would emphasize um, as well that even the reports that are out there, people talk about maybe one irregular cycle with return to normal after that. And so, you know, this is not something that we think creates any long-term problems. It's not even something that we know um, is related to the vaccine at this point, but there's definitely interest in the, um, from the NIH in studying that and that's moving forward. Okay, and we're almost to time here. We have two more questions. I think they're important. So um, I'm hoping um, we can all stay on. So this is a question um, and I'm just gonna summarize it. Um, this person has some numbers that they're giving about deaths related to the vaccine. And um, so they're saying, you know, how can you boldly declare that the vaccine is safe when people are dying from it? Isn't that dishonest? So what can um, Dr. Mayer and Dr. Pavia, what can you tell us about some of the deaths that have been linked to vaccines? Do we know anything about them? And then again, um, do you want to talk about the comparison of of the vaccine versus COVID. Sorry, my lights keep going off here. <laughs> yeah, do you want me to talk about the safety systems and how they work? So th there are no deaths. So any death and any severe illness that occurs after someone's been vaccinated can be and usually is reported to the FDA and the CDC and they're investigated. But um, to my knowledge, there are no deaths that have been attributed to vaccine whatsoever as a causal, you know, uh, cause and effect link. Um, people die all the time. And, you know, today there will be what, through 40 to 50 Utahns will die of a heart attack. Some of those people were vaccinated in the last 14 days. And so, you know, if you don't look carefully at a comparison of what happens among those who are vaccinated and unvaccinated, you can get the impression that there's a link between them. So to the best of our knowledge in the United States, Nobody has died from the vaccine. We can't speak to the rest of the world. Um, and there, you know, because allergic reactions can happen, and if you get your vaccine in a place that can't treat allergy, can't treat anaphylaxis, it is certainly possible that someone has died somewhere in Africa or Latin America of an allergic uh, response that we don't know about. But in the US, we keep a very close eye on all adverse events. Okay, and is that true even of the blood clot issues we were hearing early on with Johnson? Ah, okay, yes, I, so I misspoke. So yeah. there have been a few deaths associated with the, um, the thrombotic thrombocyte, uh, thrombotic thromb thrombocytopenic thromboses associated with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, and I don't know the number, the last time I looked, there were eight under investigation so eight out of 344 million doses, it's, it's a big deal if you were one of those eight, 
but 611,000 Americans have died of COVID. So um, again, you know, no vaccine is completely safe because no drug is completely safe, but this is as safe as any vaccine that I know of. Okay, and I, I, I wanna point out too, um, the Johnson & Johnson, we held a press conference a while back with one of our physicians, Dr. Abu Ishmael, who says, now we know the warning signs of, of Johnson & Johnson. We know how to spot it very quickly and we can treat it. And it's it's usually a kind of a smooth, and I'm sorry, Dr. Mayor, I was interrupting. I, that's, I was gonna bring up exactly that, Kathy, that now that we know that's a very rare complication providers and patients can be informed about what symptoms to look for. And if they develop any of those symptoms that rare, that, that it can be adequate, it, it can be appropriately treated to avoid death as a complication. Okay, and last question. Um, this person is saying, you know, because people are still getting COVID with the vaccine, they're still transmitting. Um, aren't you just saying you're making a choice between getting the virus or getting the virus and the vaccine? What, I'm, I'm gonna go ask all three of you to comment on that before we close. So Dr. Mayor, I'm gonna start with you. I would say no, getting the vaccine significantly decreases your chances of getting infected with the virus. And then if you are one of those fewer people that get infected, that you have a very much less risk of getting severe disease and getting hospitalized. So much, much benefit with getting vaccinated. Dr. Metz, um, what are your final thoughts on, on women, pregnant women, um, expectant moms and the vaccine? Yeah, so I mean, specific to that question, I mean, we know that this virus is associated with complications in pregnancy if you get COVID. So we know that, you know, that results in preterm delivery, that can result in cesarean delivery, that can result in a number of pregnancy complications. We know that the vaccine is not associated with pregnancy complications and that not only are you protecting yourself, but you're also protecting your fetus and newborn. And so you know, that's when we weigh these things and that's when we can say so strongly now that we really do recommend that pregnant patients get vaccinated. And Dr. Pavia, heading back to school here in a few more weeks, um, what, what is your message to families with, with both yeah. 12 year olds and, and those younger? Yeah, it, it's really important. I, you know, we need to use all the tools at our disposal. So if you've got kids who are 12 to 18, they should get the vaccine. Uh, if everyone in the family is vaccinated, that's some protection. If your kids can't be vaccinated because of age or medical conditions, uh, they really need to wear a mask going to school. But we know that the safest way to go to school is, is everyone in the classroom wears a mask during indoor classroom activities. Outside on the playground, uh, you don't need to wear a mask. But in the classroom, let's just be able to keep schools open, keep kids in class and keep them safe. Well, I wanna thank the three of you for being with us today. Um, and I really wanna thank everybody who sent in questions. We, we wanna answer all your questions. Um, so we, we have all sorts of resources on our website. There certainly are a lot of resources with the state. So we really encourage um, those of you who've been thinking about this, maybe on the fence to, to keep asking those questions. We wanna make sure you have accurate information. We'll uh, look forward to doing this again in, in another week or two, but I want to thank everybody for being here today. Dr. Mayor, Dr. Pavia, and Dr. Metz, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And we're not the only three experts. Talk to your own doctor. That's right. That's right. Thanks, everybody.